Hi guys, it's I Do Psych here. I wanted to talk to you about the pineal gland and its possible link to autism. Um, <clears throat> now, as most of you know, um, I was in the field of psychology and am currently in the field of media and marketing. So I want to talk to you a little bit about my experiences with uh, providing autistic children with ABA, which is applied behavioral analysis and uh, other techniques which um, did not often have that much success in the eyes of either myself as a uh, counselor to them nor to the parents nor the autistic uh, child. So I've been doing a little bit of research on alternative therapies for autism and came across a uh, journal that was written a long time ago um, First, before I discuss that with you, I want you to go ahead and take a brief look at this video which is going to talk a little bit more about the science of diagnosing autism in very young children as little as six months of age. Which begins, most communication is nonverbal, so kids depend heavily on reading faces. In the first study, I watched as this blue dot tracked every eye movement eight-month-old Emmett made as he looked at different faces mixed in with other distracting shapes and colors. What Emmett is saying is three different facial emotions, neutral, happy, and fear. As Emmett studies the faces, he seems to be most interested in an image you would not expect. Babies like to look more at fear, and they show more brain activity to fear. And we've been puzzled by this. They don't seem at all upset or alarmed looking at it. They just look at it more. When the results were evaluated, it was true. Like Whoa. most babies in the study, Emmett looked at the fearful face 25 percent longer. Now, here's my theory on that. Uh, it's twofold. Number one, and this is the theory that they have as well, which I believe is correct, uh, babies will entertain themselves with novelty. Uh, you notice that whenever you show your child a new toy or something, it's always going to grab their attention um, for a little bit longer than some of their older toys. Um, the other thing is, since it is the fearful face, which is the one that is the most interesting to the child, many studies have been done on this as well, um, it is surprising that this is true. However, at the same time, um, evolutionary psychologists understand that uh, it's not quite surprising at all because we are a um, endangered species now and from the beginning of time. And as we evolved as a species, we didn't need to, to lean on our um, instincts as much because the world is a relatively safe place, uh, more so than it was when you know we were living in a cave and a woolly mammoth could eat us or something. Um, however, biologically speaking, it serves a good purpose for a child to be very interested in learning a new uh, instinct to be fearful of something, to save one's life. Um, such as the case with what you probably all understand to be the uh, fight or flight response. Um, so that's that goes into sympathetic and parasympathetic nervous systems, but that's not what I'm talking about here. So let me move along here. And I actually, um, I was looking for a nice peer-reviewed journal here that I could rely on to give you some basic information. Uh, peer-reviewed journal, by the way, is a, a journal that has been reviewed by one's peers. If you are writing a paper in geology, for example, uh, you would need to submit that to a panel of your peers. They would then uh, either endorse or edit the paper on your behalf, send it back to you for revision, and you would need to complete the process again. So being that this is one of those journals, uh, Andrea Axt, which a lot of people, a lot of parents who have autistic children probably know her name very well, she actually believed there is a direct link between the pineal gland and, uh, <clears throat> and melatonin, which is a supplement, a common supplement, uh, and autism. So in her study, which by the way, uh, one thing that intrigued me is the study is from some time ago. Uh, let's see here. I did have the date for you. I'll try and put it in the link. Um, I think it's about 
at least 10 or 12 years old. Anyway, uh, so she has a really nice chart here that describes um, what the actual uh, characteristics of the autistic party is and her postulated link to pineal malfunctioning and then she gives some nice uh, she, she cites some nice references here so each of these cognitive deficits lack of speech delayed speech adverse reaction to change including environmental um, hypersensitively uh, uh, reactive to outside stimuli if you will hypersensitivity uh, sensitivity of hearing sight smell or touch so this is all uh, directly correlated, positively correlated, uh, along with disturbed sleep patterns, which is a huge hint here, uh, to lack or maladaptive or malfunctioning um, pineal gland and melatonin levels. So in her study, she was actually giving, you can go here, I will post a link here, she has several cases here where the patient was put on a therapeutic dosage according to the needs, the specific needs of the, of the party. Um, and in most of these cases, the melatonin did show that it was uh, an improvement on the child's current or previous status health-wise. Uh, now, one other thing that's very important to notice here, and that's Andrea Axe is Andrea Axe is um, a part of the Autism Society here. She actually does do um, tours and goes and gives these presentations. Uh, she talks about also, you know, craniosacral therapy. You might want to look that up. Uh, body work. If you're into the pineal gland and stuff like that, you understand that the pineal gland was once believed to be third eye. Uh, I think it was Descartes who believed that it was the seat of the soul. The pineal gland was one of the, f the last glands to actually um, be thoroughly inspected because it's very deep into the brain. Let me show you where it's at here. This is, this is uh, pretty cool. Okay, so pineal gland here. Let's... Okay, so let me show you where the pineal gland is. Uh, let's see here. Okay, so the pineal gland is right there. You can see it's deep, deep uh, inside the brain, behind the thalamus. Um, right, uh, I'm trying to think if it's, uh, you know, I don't, I don't want to use all the medical jargon here. So it is, if you would, um, in front of the uh, hypothalamus there. And it has a lot to do with the medulla oblongata. Uh, so you might want to do some research on that as well. It was long time thought that this was a very secretive gland, a hormone gland, endocrine, endocrine system gland, um, because um, many parts of the brain are asymmetrical, meaning, you know, right hemisphere, left hemisphere, etc. This is one of them that actually, you know, did not have that asymmetrical counterpart. So, you know, we thought we were onto something there. So back to the autism and melatonin. Uh, background on melatonin here, the human body um, has a built-in biological clock, as you probably know, called the circadian rhythm. Uh, this is what actually makes you fall asleep, makes you tired, makes you get up on time in the morning. Uh, you know, if you ever wonder, hey, why do I always wake up at uh, uh, 7.20 in the morning? Well, that's because your body actually has this internal clock. Um, and all of that is controlled by the pineal gland. Now, something else that's really interesting that is the pineal gland um, is if you had a feeling, for example, that uh, you're, you needed to go and check on your child right away, or say you wake up in the middle of the night and you hear your child uh, breathing a little heavy, but your husband doesn't hear it. Um, that's because uh, some people's pineal gland is just more advanced. It is an instinctual part of the human brain that isn't quite fully understood. Now, you might want to look up reticular formation, so that's going to explain more about that, but that's only if you really want to get into the science of this here. 
So we all know animals have uh, a wildly crazy pineal gland that allows them to sense things like uh, I've talked about this before. So animals can sense danger because of this, if you want to call it third eye. Uh, migration has a lot to do with that. Um, let's see here. Oh yeah. Here we go. Rene Descartes was fascinated with the pineal gland. He did regard it as a principal seat of the soul, and he believed that's where a lot of our thoughts were formed. However, you know, that theory kind of got displaced um, when people started believing, hey, the heart has to do a lot with certain things, emotions and feelings, um, you know, other parts of the brain their intricate, um, intricate behaviors were studied more. So uh, the pineal gland is only about mm, that big. It's tiny. So uh, it does secrete melatonin. So it serves to, uh, to show that if you were lacking melatonin to begin with, that this could be part of the problem if a child is autistic. Now, it has two different functions. Like I said, the circadian or biological rhythm, and then it also regulates reproductive hormones. Uh, <clears throat> a lot of this can get uh, very complicated. Some of this has to do with some actual cells, uh, Purkinje cells and uh, oligodendrogria. Um, I mean, it gets pretty complicated, so I'm just trying to keep this very, very simple just so that if there is a parent watching out there who hasn't actually heard of a therapy using uh, actual melatonin or checking on, I would rather say too, to check on the immune system, uh, which has a lot of uh, correlation. Um, now, it's not always a good idea to give your child melatonin. So you're definitely going to want to check before you speak to a physician. I, I can't be your doctor, obviously, here on YouTube. So um, check with your doctor. See what they think. Uh, a lot of parents are using it as a therapy, number one, because autistic children many times have problems with sleep. Um, number two, because um, you know, they've tried everything else. <laughs> Um, number three, what I would uh, say most importantly there with melatonin is, you know, it could be something that deals with the immune system that's actually the, the main problem causing the lack of melatonin. So that's why when it works in some children, uh, we're not really fixing the root of the problem. So I'm more inclined to say fix the root of the problem, find out if there's an immune problem or a dietary problem. Uh, many diets have been known that work for uh, autism. I personally like uh, Sarah's diet for autism. Um, so uh, it's very interesting to see that Andrea Axe is still speaking. So, and the last thing I wanted to point out, and I know this gets a little bit conspiracy laden here, trying not to, but you know, can't avoid it all the time. Uh, I only try and look at these peer reviewed journals to see if, you know, we can come up with something that's based on uh, actual fact that people have found. So I did find this one article though. It's, it's not a peer reviewed journal. Um, however, this Jennifer Loop did use it as part of her um, her PhD thesis, and it was published in the Carey's Research under the fluoride de uh, deposition in the aged human pineal gland. Now, uh, with that being said, I'm not really sure if this is peer reviewed. I'll have to check it for you. It might be. So, um, yeah. Basically, what they're saying is that fluoride has a lot to do with, uh, has a lot of responsibility when it comes to autism. So I don't know if I believe in that yet. Now, a lot of this isn't taught to us in, um, in school. It's not taught to us uh, who are in grad school or regular, you know, getting your bachelor's degree for psychology or anything. So, you know, parents just, you know, I'm sure you're doing the best that you can looking into all this stuff. I applaud you. You guys are my absolute hero. I have seen what you go through. Uh, keep looking. We are going to find an answer. This is too young of a disease to not find an answer as, as long as we don't quit. So I'm, I'm I do psych and I hope you're having a wonderful day. Bye.